how do we use the shield of faith? Is this some mystical thing? Is it, is it ethereal? Is it incomprehensible? Is it only for kind of the elevated, uh, those that have arisen to some spiritual master level? Or is it really simple? And basically the shield of faith is any time when confronted with a temptation. All temptations are a temptation to not go God's way, to go the way of the world or the way of the flesh or the way of the devil. A temptation is to go the wrong direction. It's a fork in the road. Whenever we come to a fork in the road and we're tempted to go this way, the shield of faith is when we are reminded of or remember or are given God's truth and we respond to that truth and go God's way. In that instant, faith in God's way extinguishes the fiery dart, the temptation to go the wrong way. And so the shield of faith is when we hold the truth of God's word and respond to it and, and actually say, God, I want your way, not my own way. And, and, it, and it sometimes is constantly repeated, but it's simple and it's faith that shield us, shields us, and it works every time we use it. Every time we're faced with the fork in the road and we can go our way, the world's way, our flesh's way, the devil's way, or say no, the Bible calls it denying or, or rejecting or uh, forsaking, and, and go God's way, there's this grace burst. It's, it's just the divine energy, it's kind of like, either splitting or fusing an atom, there's this incomprehensible energy released. Grace is poured out upon us. Grace to help in time of need. When we choose by faith what God has revealed over what the lie or the temptation of the devil. So uh, in, in Colossians 2, but as we open to Colossians 2, and we're gonna read verses one through seven momentarily, we need to learn a practical lesson because what I think is that there's all of a sudden this glaze that comes over when we talk about how to apply spiritual truths. I, I see this because I'm a professional you know, Bible explainer. I see uh, almost a, a response when, when someone comes with a trouble, a problem, whatever, or a question, and you say, well, God says, it's like they go, they go, no, 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 we're in the real world. We're, we're, we're dealing with, with, I mean, politics and issues and violence. I wasn't asking for a Bible answer. I would like to know. And, and when you bring up spiritual, it's kind of mystifying to people. So pause and think about the word spiritual. We have spiritual warfare. That's what this series is about. God has offered spiritual armor. All of this is tied to our spiritual lives. Spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. When you say spiritual, for some people it means ethereal. Uh, in, in fact, sometimes, does the term spiritual sound like a truth that's difficult or hard to grasp, that's kind of out there that, that, that we never quite get to and the spiritual world is out there and the real world is here. See, that's when we talk about the election cycle and all that, you understand that, that we have a generation immersed in the now. I mean, a shot can ring out 10,000 miles from here and someone's got their, you know, Facebook live stream on it and it's, it's playing. I mean, there's, it's almost like we're all experiencing everything as it happens and it's so real. And we forget that nothing surprises God, nothing happens apart from his providential and sovereign, powerful control. And that everything we need to know to understand the world He's already written down everything, not most, not a lot. Everything we need for life and godliness, God has here. And so we sometimes, spiritual, sounds distant. It's hard to grasp. And this morning we're pondering the shield of faith. And this shield can sound mysterious or mystical or almost like something that's imaginary. Like augmented reality. I was talking to my son that lives in San Francisco and you know, the, one of the biggest downloads in history was the, 
the Pokemon Go, and 20 million people now are actively going and looking for the little mythical Japanese figures. And he said that he was, he was in Sunnyvale. Uh, Sunnyvale is, I think, where Apple is, I don't know. But it's out there, and, and it's Silicon Valley for sure. And he said that, that a friend of his invited him to a park because there's a phenomenon. There were, he, he believes, 500 of these high-tech engineers, all with their phones, and they were all augmenting reality with their phones, trying to detect those little demons that they're looking for. And when they found him, they'd go, ah, I found a whatever. And he was standing up on the hill watching. And all these $200,000 a year engineers would run with their phones because they wanted to. And that was so real to them that someone found one. I don't know if this is intentional or if the GPS coordinates got wrong, but it was actually in the highway. And they stopped the traffic and all of them clumped out to do their augmented reality on a freeway and capture their little thing, whatever they're capturing. Did you know that's real for people? I mean, even highly educated, highly trained, amazing people. And many doctrines in God's word seems imaginary. They seem almost unreal. They're out of touch with where we live or they're impossible. And that's exactly what Paul was dealing with when he wrote Colossians 2. He wrote to a church that had never met him face to face. Look at verse 1. What does it say? Colossians 2, 1. As many as have not seen my face. He said, you all have never met me. You've never sat under my teaching. All you've done is heard people talk about the big things Paul is teaching. And he says, I want to teach you how to grab and hold on to big doctrines. Even though it's hard because you haven't met me, you haven't seen me, you haven't heard my voice, all you've done is heard someone else's voice repeating what they heard me say. But the amazing thing is, he was writing, if you look at the uh, first part of, uh, let me get to Colossians 2. If you look at chapter 1 of Colossians, it's to saints and faithful brethren. The one common denominator of the people that he was saying to grab and hold on to big doctrines is, they all had been what? What is that word? Saved. They all were born again. And he said, if you have truly been saved, then you have already learned how to grab and how to hold on to doctrines from God. They're from a God you've never met face to face, from a Jesus Christ you've never met face to face, written down by biblical authors you couldn't pick out of a lineup. I mean, can you imagine trying to find Timothy or James in this lineup of people? You wouldn't know which one was which. But by faith, if we're saved, we have learned to, by faith, reach out and take God at his word. And that instant of reaching out to him and believing what he said utterly has changed us. So Paul said to this group of people, you need to grasp spiritual things. And that challenge has always been with us since the first century. And that's part of Paul's motivation. Paul wrote to a church that had never met him, a church that only heard others talk about him. They were needing help. Paul writes a letter to him. The letter's called Colossians. The Colossians were a group of believers Paul had never met face to face. And so in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 2 that we're going to read, we find Paul explaining how to apply the most amazing doctrines. And he reduces it to this. The same way you got saved is the same way you live the Christian life. Now that's interesting. Let's test all the different ways people think they got saved. The way you got saved by being good is the way you live the rest of the Christian life, by trying to be good. That's not what the Bible says. The way you got saved by some religious ceremony like baptism or, or some other religious ceremony is how you got saved. So you're supposed to keep doing religious ceremonies to live the Christian life. That's not what the scriptures say. Paul said the same way that you heard the truth of God, believed the truth of God, and by faith reached out, calling on the name of the Lord, is the same way the rest 
of your spiritual life goes. There's no dichotomy there. There's no different track. The same way you got saved is the same way that we live the Christian life. So, in Colossians 2, verses 1 through 7, Paul says you need to go back to your starting point. You need to go back to the origination of your spiritual life and, and remind yourself how you even got into this life. And that's how you live every other day. It never gets above entry level. It's a continuous series of new beginnings. The new beginning in Christ we receive by trusting and believing in the word of God and calling out in faith is the same new beginning we live every day the rest of our life. So Colossians 2, going back to the starting point, we're going to read the first seven verses. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Remain standing, I'll pray. And then we're going to dive into this passage. And Paul is sharing a secret that we all need to regularly go back to. And that's how it all began. Verse one. For I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and for those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Verse two. That their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God both of the Father and of Christ. Verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now pause, he's affirmed they were saved. Now look at verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. The same simple faith of a child that you hear, you believe it's true, you act on it. You hear you're lost, you believe it's true, so you call out to the only one that can save you. And he does. He said, that's the way you live the rest of your life. So look what it says in verse 7. Rooted, built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Wow, the simple pathway of following Christ, the way you got saved, the way you live the rest of, the li of our lives on earth in Christ. Simple. Wow. Wow. Let's bow. Father, I pray that you'd open our hearts to understand your word and not just understand some facts, but to experience truth. I pray that we'd realize that any portion of your word that reveals your will that we respond to is taking up and holding the shield of faith. And every time we do that, when tempted, Satan's dart will be extinguished. I pray we might begin to engage in holding your truth of your word as our shield and see it work. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're seated, let's just do that. Let's go back to the starting point, okay? As you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. Simple, simple, simple. And, and what happens is we get rooted and build up. So that's what God says. The simple pathway of following Christ is you heard. We all heard different ones, different portions, but you heard the truth. Then you believed the truth. You heard the truth that all of us are born sinners. You believed that. You testified. That's true. I am a sinner. And then you responded. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All of us who are saved... We heard the gospel, we believed the gospel, not all the gospel, the gospel. What's fascinating is that if we believe the truth about God, it's called the engrafted word, he saves our soul and implants in us this voracious hunger for truth. So we just keep learning more and more. I look back at what did I know, the truth about God? I knew that I was bad and I knew that Jesus died for bad people and I wanted his payment to take away my sin. I only knew that much. Elementary, childlike. 
but he still absolutely transformed me at six years of age. Now, he hasn't stopped transforming me, and I've learned a vast amount more about him, but the way I received him is how I'm still supposed to walk in him. I listen to him, I believe him, and I respond to him. So what does that look like? Well, now this is what's vital, and, and this is what we need to rehearse in our minds. Because it's very confusing if we don't reaffirm what the Bible says. Basically, the Bible would be evangelical. You know what evangelical means? You ever heard of an evangelical? An evangelical is a group of people that believes that everyone was born lost, born warped, born wicked, born sinners. Everyone infected with sin. Now, every time you post a picture of that newborn on Facebook, no matter how much you massage it with all the filters, you are portraying a desperately wicked, infected sinner with a terminal illness that is the worst illness of all, sin. Now, you can powder them, ribbon them, fluff them, and clothe them. But it's a desperately lost sinner that was born. Now, right there is a barrier. You can't share the gospel with people that don't believe they're sinners. I mean, you can, but it doesn't do any good. Because Jesus only died for sinners. And if they're not, then they are excluded from the benefit. Or if they think they were born, but through something surrounding their birth, that either a religious practitioner, you know, like me, I could be classified as that, or their parents did something to them, they got rid of their sin. No parent can do anything to get rid of our sin because parents can't get rid of sin because only God can get rid of sin. And God said the first truth that must be embraced for sin to be removed is to know and believe and confess that you're a sinner. Then that is totally tied to believing God's word because I don't know that I am a sinner, at least in the fullest extent, until I listen to the word of God, until I hear what God says. God has declared, I'm a sinner by nature, I'm a sinner by choice, but I'm also a sinner by divine decree. God declares I'm a sinner. My nature is sinful, and I, because my nature is sinful, choose to sin. Now, think about those elements, those three, because uh, when we have baptisms, we tell people to write their testimony. They go, I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. I said, well, uh, let's start with this. When were you born? Do you know that? Most people do, you know? So we can keep going if they know when they were born. I say, okay, on May 1st, 1927, you were born a desperate, wicked sinner. If they're repulsed by that and go, wait a minute, no, 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 no. They don't have a testimony. That's what God says, Romans 3. We're all desperately wicked. And then we hear the word and then we respond. So think about that. As you receive the Lord, so walk in him. Heard, believed, responded. How did you and I get saved? I mean, really. We were born lost and alienated from God. We had a sin-infected heart at birth. We began to show signs of that terminal infection almost immediately. Right out of the womb, we're in various ways selfish, self-centered, easily angered, jealous and filled with rage. And that's only as a little tiny person. And then we grow up and specialize in some forms of those. Not all of us do all of them, and not all of us do all of them with all of our heart. And some people that, that they incarcerate or worse are ones that really are practiced in the really, you know, dangerous sins. But we're all practiced sinners, and we grow up into various forms of sinful behavior. And then we hear the gospel that Jesus came to seek and save lost sinners. We're convicted that we sinned. We understand we're sinners. We begin to feel lostness, separation from God. It's called conviction. And by faith, we call out to the Lord. Remember, the Bible says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I remember talking to someone, and they said that they were standing in a church choir. They were part of this big, you know, church choir, 
and they were standing there with their nice songbook and they were singing and all of a sudden, standing there, they thought, I'm singing about something that's never happened to me. And they paused singing and said, Lord, I want that. And it was a portion of the word of God that was in the words that they were singing. And the, their faith was in hearing the truth about God. They believed it. They believed what God said and that they weren't. And so then they responded. They were saved by faith. Uh, then we were saved. How are we saved? By believing simple truth from God's word. God loved the world. God gave his only son. Jesus died for me. I must ask him to forgive and save me. Now think about that sequence. Think about the sequence. Born a sinner, believing truth about God, the gospel, saved by faith. Basically, that's what simple faith is. And that's the same as the simple faith shield. As you receive the Lord, walk in him. The simple faith, trusting what God says and acting on it, is what shields us from the fiery darts of the evil one. We hear powerfully massive truths from scripture and simply believe them. We believe that God is in human flesh. We believe that he walked among us. We believe that he lived a perfect life. We believe that he suffered in our place. And in that instant, we say, you died for me. Not just them, me. Save me. And that's simple faith. So, we never saw God. We, we can't. God is not visible. He's an invisible spirit. But we can see him because the exact representation of God is in Jesus Christ. We never met Jesus personally in the flesh. We couldn't pick any of the gospel writers out of a lineup if we tried. And our salvation was totally by faith. And the Lord says, just like you received me that way, walk in me that way. And you will get more and more rooted and grounded in faith. We simply act on what the scripture says about God. We believe the written propositional truth from the scriptures. Now, it could come, you know, orally presented to us. It could come by us turning the Bible around, letting them read it, or reading it aloud to them. Parents telling their children, hearing it in a message, singing and, and hearing it in a song. But we believe what is written. The, the propositional truth from the scriptures and when we believe that and respond to that by faith, see, the, the key is many people, James says, many people are like the devils. They, they miss heaven by 18 inches. Do you think that the devils, the demons, do you think they believe who Jesus is? You bet. Scare, they, he scared them to death. They're always screeching when they got around him. They knew he's real. They watched him in his power. They've, they've been alive continuously since creation. They've watched it all. They've witnessed transformed lives. They've witnessed the miracle power, miraculous power of God. And they've seen it all. They believe and tremble. They believe truth about God. They don't respond to it. They know it's so true, they tremble. There are many people that know it's true. I remember when I used to be a... I pastored in the South at the beginning in Georgia, and I remember uh, uh, I, I pastored and, and trained under uh, Walter Burrow was his name, and he was an evangelist, and he traveled. That's how I got, it was great. He was always out doing revivals, and I got to preach, and it was the best, you know. He was the pastor, but he was never there, and I always got to preach, and I got to practice, and they were so kind, you know, and they'd give me a little extra fried chicken when I had a bad sermon, say, it's okay, try more next week, you know, and it was really nice. And... Um, but boy, he was right. He told me, he says, he said, he taught me how to do invitations and uh, I would break my neck if I did what he did. He just walked right out into the congregation. This is too big a drop. But he would walk up and down the aisles and he'd say, what keeps you? What keeps you from coming to Christ? What keeps you? Can you imagine that? I mean, everyone would be singing. He'd be walking the aisles looking for every unsaved person he knew. And he said that they would just go like this and hold on to the pew in front of them. They believed and trembled, but they did not respond. Did you know, as you receive the Lord believing and responding, that's what the shield of faith is, that we allow God not just to transform us in salvation, 
but to deliver us. See, the same, the, the deliverance, the, the uh, quenching the fiery darts is when we believe the written propositional truth of the scriptures, and we'll see that in just a minute. I'll, I'll give you a list of them. When we believe that, God delivers us. So let's, let's do a mathematical equation, okay? Here we go. The old person, that's us, plus faith in what God said equals a transformation into a new person. An old person, dead in their trespasses and sin, who believes what God says, God transforms them. That's just 2 Corinthians 5, 17 as an equation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new is coming. That's what God is doing. When we old us have a fresh new beginning by faith. So that's what the Lord offers. So how does that apply to Ephesians? So back up. We're in Colossians. Back up. Colossians to the left, Philippians. And through all of Philippians, you get to chapter 6. So in chapter 6, what we see is a repetition of response required. That's what the armor is about. The, the constant repetition, and I'll read through this, and what you see is there's a repeated pattern. And I made your little chart as I read. Uh, basically, the fiery dart is shot, we are tempted to sin, and, and in that moment, we have to make a choice, the fork in the road. Are we gonna go Satan's way, the way that, that everyone else is going, the way that our flesh and body wants to go, or are we gonna resist and go God's way? Constant choice. That's, that's what we're faced with. The shield of faith is when, and, and what's interesting, uh, I really like uh, one of the dis descriptions of what God does. It's the spontaneous bringing to our mind of a previously learned scripture. That's what the benefit of Bible study is. Because when we, in that moment, have this, this scripture, this truth about God that comes to us in that moment and we believe it and we choose to go God's way, not to go Satan's way. See the fork in the road. We, we come to this point and in that instant, the shield of faith is saying, I believe what God says. And not do I just believe it and it scares me, but I act on it. It, it says we take the shield of faith. We put on the helmet of salvation. We take the sword of the Spirit. See, each of these, it's not enough to have back in the bunkhouse a shield, a sword, and a helmet. You have to be carrying the shield, holding the sword, and wearing the helmet. It's very, very pointed. And when that happens, the dart, as soon as we say, God, I believe your word, he extinguishes the dart. As soon as we call out to him in faith saying, I believe your word, I want your way, not mine, he delivers us and wow, he is glorified at every, you know, every moment of our day when we come to the fork in the road and we're being shot at and choosing, when we when we go Satan's way and we go the flesh's way and, and we say that we lost our temper or whatever, we went back to our old ways, it doesn't glorify God. But when we say no, I want to deny ungodliness. I don't want to yield my members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. God extinguishes the dart, delivers us, and he is glorified. So what does that look like? Well, there's body armor in Ephesians 6, 11 to 17. Look, at, I'll read it, and you can see what it looks like. Uh, each piece of the spiritual armor has to be responded to. Just like we had to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, so we must respond to God's call to take and wear each piece. The body armor, it must be used. Put it on and take it up. The belt of truth, it must be buckled. It's not enough to just know it's there. Having girded yourself with truth. The vest of righteousness, I mean, did you see the picture? One of the men in our, um, one of Calvary's policemen, probably more, but one from my Bible study that attends Calvary was in Cleveland. And they were a part of all the convention protection. And uh, I was, you know, keeping up and watching how things were going. And one day it showed the, the bicycle squads. Wow. 
I mean, did you see the policemen that rode the bicycles, what they wore? I mean, they just look like a tank. They had, uh, from the bottoms of their feet to the top of their head, this amazing, kind of like armadillo, black body armor. I mean, they were ready for anything. Now, can you imagine that was issued to them by someone? I don't know if those were Ohio police or, you know, you couldn't see who they were because they were wearing it. But I don't know if they were from Ohio or Michigan or wherever they were from, but someone issued them an outfit. Can you imagine all of them lined up with their little bicycles facing the, the riot situation and one of them is just, you know, in his gym shorts? I mean, what if he fell off his bike? He'd be totally scraped and bruised, but the other ones wouldn't be. Why? Because they put it on. See, the body armor is supposed to be worn. Uh, the, the, that vest of righteousness has to be strapped on, having put it on. How about the boots of peace? They must be tied up, having shod your feet. Uh, with the boots of peace. The shield of faith, that's where we are in verse 16. It must be held. The Roman legionnaires were each issued a shield. But many of them, according to Edward P. Gibbon, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, said they started leaving them home. It was too heavy to carry. This is like a door. This big metal-covered door, you want to carry that all the time? Why, it ached, you know, made my shoulder sore. (laughs) You got shot with an arrow didn't have your shield, left at home. Great job, fella. You know, do you see, it has to be, for it to work, you have to carry it with you. And so it must, it must be held. How about the helmet of salvation? It must be worn. Don't just carry it around. Don't know a lot of cute truths about the Bible. Apply them. I can't wait till we get to that. Did you know what the helmet of salvation is? Understanding the gospel. Understanding what Christ did. And, and preaching the gospel to ourselves. And when Satan tempts me to despair, Upward I look and see him there, as the hymn writer said. I remind myself of the truth of the gospel. I'm wearing the helmet. I'm holding the shield. And I'm, look what it says about the sword. It has to be used. Take the sword of the spirit. So basically, you and I, every day, can see God extinguishing the darts. How do we see him extinguishing the darts? Now, it's 1126. According to you know, the schedule, I have 19 minutes to explain this chart. Do you know why I'm saying that? Because I got a sweet note from a lady this week. She said, for three weeks, I have sat with my pen out waiting for the list. I want my shield. I mean, she actually wrote, I want my shield. I've waited for three weeks. Give me my shield. And I thought, someone already gave it to you, but I will remind you of it. Here it is. Okay, now don't try and get this because I'm doing a big version, but I I want you to see the whole map. When faced with besetting sins and bad habits or fear and depression, what I did is the big seven. You know, there are seven cardinal sins. You know, uh, the Catholic Church talks about, well, I just did the big seven. Um, Besetting sins and bad habits, almost everybody has one or both. Either a besetting sin and some bad habits or just a lot of bad habits that are developing into besetting sins. Fear and depression. Why is this the most repeated negative prohibition in the Bible? Because we are like sheep. We're easily spooked. We're easily fearful. We fear everything. We fear the future. We fear the past. We fear the present. We fear our health and money and people and uh, and depression. When you meditate on your fears, it spirals down and you start believing it. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling storm that is, you know, tornadically pulling us downward. So when faced with besetting sins, believe God's word. When faced with fear and depression, believe God's word. When faced with, with my words that aren't edifying, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Uh, set a watch at the door of my tongue that I sin not against you with my lips. Uh, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. I believe God's word. I say you can set a watch at the door of my mouth. You can make me appropriately use my gear here. I only have one mouth and two ears, so listen a lot longer than I talk. And, and, And I can allow you to salt and grace season my words. So I'm at a juncture. And I'm talking about things that not only are not edifying, they're defiling. And I can say, Lord, set a watch, 
Stop that. Stop me. I surrender my tongue, my mouth, my voice to you. Let me hear and speak little. Let me allow your spirit to energize my words. Uh, when, when faced with the lust of the flesh, all the cravings, uh, they're not all sensual. Uh, uh, the Bible has much to say about what we would call spiritual discipline in our lives. Uh, there are many lusts, but those cravings, especially the sensual ones, are very dealt with in the scriptures. Uh, the pride of life, this, this our own way and wanting our own way and wanting to promote ourselves instead of promoting God. Pride is when I'm more concerned about promoting myself than making God great. And, and we can... We can promote ourselves in any venue, whether it's ministry or the world or sports or the arts or business or life or a family or a marriage. We just, we're, we're constantly hit with these three. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's what 1 John 2 says are the three starters. You know, when you have sourdough, you have the starter and the, you know, the, the dough starter in your fridge and you feed it and then you use it and it permeates. These are the starters for all sins. All sin, the starter for them, either they're motivated by the lust of the flesh or cravings, the pride of life, the centrality of me to my life, or the lust of the eyes, materialistic, finer things. All are sin. When those, when those dominate when I'm consumed by materialism, consumed by myself, or consumed by my cravings. So when I have the lust of the flesh, I believe God's word. And it always works. Always. To extinguish the dart of the moment. It doesn't extinguish lifetime darts. It extinguishes them as they come. See, God wants us holding his hand, walking through life with him. When the pride of life comes, I don't want to glory in my wisdom or might or, or possessions, but glory in the Lord. And I want in my life to clothe myself with humility. Colossians 3, 12 to 14 says, humility is kind of like an outfit we wear. And we either choose to put it on or not. And when we put it on, it's reflective. It absorbs us and reflects God. And he increases and we decrease. And it's kind of like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was the agent of God. And he comes and shares the gospel. The Ethiopian eunuch gets it. And he leaves Philip in the dust and goes on rejoicing. And God spirits Philip away to do it again because Philip had decreased and God had increased. And God could drop him in a situation and he could be a catalyst and the tool God used, and he could go on to another, and that person didn't get stuck to him. They went out into ministry. And that, that's amazing, to clothe yourself with humility and to humble. It's a command in James 4. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. How about wasting time? You know, it says in Psalm 119, we're going to look at this. In fact, Psalm 119 has 83 clear requests for God to deliver from something. They're all preceded, it's a, it's a verb and then a me. Deliver me, quicken me, uh, turn away me, open my. You know, all the way through, it's the most amazing clarity of how to not waste our time. Do you know what this one is? Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. Can you imagine standing before the judgment seat of Christ and saying, I watched 114,000 minutes of YouTube videos. And the Lord says, put it on the conveyor belt. Let's see how it does in the fire. It all burns up. And we suffer loss because we don't turn away our eyes from looking. It's clear not to look at wicked things, it's worthless things. Most of us won't look at wicked things. We have decided, I will not set before me any wicked thing. But we sure don't mind worthless ones. And that's something that is another part of growing, wasting time, because it's our most valuable commodity. Lust of the eyes, materialism. Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. He says, I'm going to test you with fire, and you're going to answer for your life. So, 
I told you you'd get the big version. Here's the big version, okay? Number one, when faced with besetting sins and bad habits, what are we supposed to do? Look at Romans 6. And these, these should be, just be marked and starred and highlighted. Romans 6, starting in verse 11, is fascinating. Did you know that there, there's doctrine all the way through chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 of Romans, and the first time that you get to a command is in verse 11. And that's the first, God says on the basis of all the truth about God, here's what I want your response to be. When faced with my body and mind and emotions getting under sins and bad habits, I look at God's word and I'm at a juncture. I can choose to either continue to what it says in, in verse 11, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God. I've told you the story many times. For one day, I was a rancher in Texas. I went to visit my roommate uh, from Texas. My roommate was a Texan. I mean, the whole thing, the big white hat and the boots and the talk. But I didn't know when he was my roommate that he was also rich. And he used to get once a month a couriered letter and he'd open it up, he'd sign it, and he'd put it back in and send it back. When I got to Texas, I found out what it was. His parents kept bequeathing him an oil well every month. They had a 10,000 acre ranch. You know what they raised? Oil wells. Uh, they had cows under them, but they were pumping oil as fast as they could. It was just amazing. I mean, when I got to his house, their chairs were elephant's feet. They had an actual, with you know, the big toenails and all, this high, you sat on elephant's feet. Their, their table, I mean, it was just unbelievable. But So they took me out to see their ranch, 10,000 acres. That's 16 square miles of oil wells and cows. Barzonas they had. His mother was a quintessential Texan, had the big hat, you know, the whole deal, with all the boots and everything. And, and she had her hat held in with what? Hat pins. And she said, stop the Jeep. So the driver stopped the Jeep. And we all got out. She said, I want to show you something, son. You're in the ministry, I hear, she said. I want to teach you a lesson. And she pulled out of her hat a hat pin. You know, it kind of has the pearl on the end, and it's a long, pointy thing. And she said, watch this. And there was a 1,700-pound Barzona, kind of black Angus cow. Looked like a tank. And on the side, burned in, was the triple bar whatever their ranch was called, their 16-mile, square-mile ranch. And they had this elaborate brand with their logo. And when that cow was little, they'd burned that thing in. I never thought of that. You know, kind of sounds cruel to me, you know, but it's what you need to do. She said, did you know cows can't feel? They're desensitized. They have been burned. They've, they've been seared. They no longer feel that, that area. And she took her hat pin and went, right in that 1,700-pound cow. I expected, you know, boom, throw her. And it never stopped chewing. She poked it with a hat pin. <laughs> poked it several times, Nothing. She put it back in her hat and said, I hope you get a sermon illustration. So I did that just for her, okay? <laughs> what Romans 6 says, never get desensitized to sin. Consider yourself dead to sin's voice. Never get desensitized to the conviction to deny ungodliness. We are the other way. We're like the cows. Sin doesn't bother us anymore. God says, no. You're supposed to be dead to sin. And when it calls you, when it knocks, when it, when it gets, don't let it get your attention. Say no. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin. Verse 12, don't let it rain. Don't let it take over. Verse 13, don't present your members. When we find ourselves using our eyes or our ears or our mouths or our hands for something, we have to say no. I will stop presenting my members as instruments of unrighteousness. Here's the positive side but present yourself to God. Don't, 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 but do. And Colossians 3, 5, put to death your members which are on the earth. Kill 
any attachment to that sin. Don't, it's kind of like disconnecting the phone. It's kind of like stopping the service. It's like cutting the cord. Don't allow the direct feeding of sin in our life. Put it to death, he says. We believe God. If God says we can reckon ourselves dead, Romans 6, we can. If God says sin doesn't have to reign, verse 12 of chapter 6, it doesn't have to. If God says don't present your members, we, we are able to not. If he says present ourselves, we can. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your body. Say it's not mine, it's yours, and I want my mind renewed. What does Titus 2.12 says? It says, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. How do we do that? Verse 11 says, it's the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness. The instant we're faced, we get shot, we feel the dart and the heat, and we see it starting a fire. And that fire is drawing us away from God. And we pause. And in that instant, we remember God's way and we're already drawn to Satan's way. And in that instant, when we remember God's way, we say, God, I want your way, not my way, my flesh's way, sin's way. I want your way. Immediately, he extinguishes the dart, stops the fire, opens a way of escape, delivers us, we, we experience this burst of grace. He is glorified and we're reinforced that God is real. That's what happens every time. You say, like happens every time I talk, people say, well, what about Ephesians whatever and what about Philippians whatever and what about Romans whatever? And I go, uh-huh. That's why the shield of faith isn't that list. That's just part of of the manifestations of the shield of faith, any portion of God that reveals his truth that we respond to in resistance to the devil and in response to God becomes a shield because we're acting by faith going God's way and not Satan's way. And that's what the Lord wants us to do and it's time for us to go. So this is what we have to do. It's time to stand up and as you stand up and pack up and put away your Bibles, What's your besetting sin? What, what's your bad habit? It makes Bible study completely different. When I'm reading the Bible, I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about, oh yeah, the guy in the third row down on the left, he needs that verse. I'm looking at what God can do to transform me into conformity with Christ. And I am saying, I know the areas that so easily beset me. I know the areas that don't reflect Christ. I want to open those areas to the scrutiny of your word. And God, I want to yield to you. I want you to conform me and transform my mind. I want to put to death. I want your grace to cause me to deny. Each one of us should individually be mining the word of God, looking for truth, that impacts our so easily beset sins and our habits, those parts of our life that don't reflect Christ. That's the purpose of Bible study. So everyone that doesn't study the Bible says, I'm perfect, I don't need any fixing up by Christ. No, the more you study the Bible, the more you confess, I need you. Only you can sanctify me. I'm inviting you every day to change me into the image of Christ. Let's bow forward a prayer. Father, I thank you for the shield, which is your word responded to by faith. I pray that we'd be looking through your word, seeing how far we're short of your plan and asking you to change us and I pray we'd have the joy of experiencing that burst of your grace to see the dart, fiery dart, extinguished and seeing you glorified as you make a way of escape and deliver us. I pray that you'd strengthen our faith, increase our faith, pour out your grace so that we can respond. And help us to think biblically like we're going to practice tonight, to see through the lens of Scripture 
what we're reading about in the news. You are orchestrating the news to accomplish your purpose. You want us to respond your way. Teach us how to do that more and more. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.